what do tanning and the Mona Lisa have in common? If your guess is that Leonardo da Vinci invented the tanning machine, or maybe sunblock, that is an excellent guess. Uh, but it's wrong. Aww. If you guess that the worst damage ever suffered to the Mona Lisa is when a tourist slipped and a bottle of sunscreen spilled all over it, that's really the worst guess of all time. Okay, the answer to the question is that getting a tan and pushing through those crazy crowds to get a selfie in front of the Mona Lisa are things that many travelers feel are intrinsic to their trip, but that a century ago people would have considered preposterous. Okay, now I realize some of you couldn't care less if you're tan, or you can't tan, or you're perfectly happy with your skin color the way it is, or you've been ordered to stay under the sun by your doctor, and of course not everyone who goes to Paris insists on seeing the Mona Lisa. I get it. Bear with me, you'll see where I'm going. I'm Seth Kugel. This is the new Globally Curious YouTube channel. If you've missed the first few videos, check them out afterwards. Here we talk about travel, but we take a hard look at it. Why are people traveling? What are they doing? How is the travel industry affecting how they're doing it and how to travel better? Many of us, those of us that can tan, uh, it's kind of become a main travel activity. We go, we lie down in the sun, we try to get tan, we check out tan we are, we look at our tan line, I'm not going to show you. And of course these days we do it with sunblock, and then these days we know it might not be too great for us anyway, and these days being too tan is also a little ridiculous. But despite all that, many of us still think that having a tan makes us look better, or look healthier, or whatever. And even if we don't, uh, we kind of want to tan anyway. Like, I'll go away and I'll put like sunscreen all over my face. I'll be like, oh, I can't get a tan. But then at the end of the day, I'm like, hmm, did I get a tan? Great. But listen to this. Before the 1920s, white people, and we are basically talking about Europeans and people of European origin here, they didn't tan. They didn't want to tan. It just wasn't a thing. In fact, the opposite was true whiter skin was considered more beautiful, more ideal. Tanning was something that was totally unavoidable if you worked out in the fields, but white was considered kind of more beautiful, more of the beauty ideal. You've seen Renaissance paintings, women with alabaster skin, even like the adjective fair. She had fair skin. Guess what? The original meaning of fair skin was not light skin. It was actually beautiful skin. The word fair meant beautiful. London Bridge is falling down, my fair lady. El puente de Londres va a caer, mi bella dama. Le pont de Londres tombe, ma belle dame. But over time, the meaning of fair went from beautiful to white. You don't really have to think too hard to figure out how that happened. So why would people suddenly want to get a tan? Well, of course, it was a fashion trend. And it was a fashion trend largely started by one person, Coco Chanel. That's right, Coco Chanel came back from a trip and she was tan. And since whatever she did was fashionable, and by the way, she still is pretty fashionable today, I do use Bleu de Chanel, in case you're wondering what that fragrance is coming through your monitor. Coco Chanel was not the only force behind this. Uh, another influence was Josephine Baker, who was a performer and civil rights activist, popular in Paris in like the 1930s. She was African-American, and people thought she was beautiful and wonderful and fantastic, and of course, wanted to be like her. And those are just two pieces. I'm sure there's much more. But the bottom line is that tanning is just an invention. Now the Mona Lisa. The Mona Lisa is not a 20th century invention. Uh, it has been around much longer than that. And since at least the middle of the 19th century, it's been considered a very, very fine painting. Uh, if you would ask someone in, say, 1890 to name the top 100 paintings in the world, it may very well have been on the list. But there are a lot of other paintings in the top 100. In addition to Mona Lisa, there must be like 97. Yet back then, people were not doing crazy things just to get that far away from it. If you actually read Mark Twain's book, The Innocents Abroad, which is from the same era, he actually goes to the Louvre and doesn't even mention the Mona Lisa. So obviously it was not like something everyone wanted to see. Today, people are doing crazy things just to get like that far away from it. I mean, that's nuts. Oh, and the Louvre says, or at least they said in a report a couple years ago, that 80% of its visitors say they come principally to see the Mona Lisa because, you know, there's nothing else in the Louvre to see. So why? Why did this happen? Why did a painting go from like pretty good painting to like 
We must see the Mona Lisa. It's because of something that happened on August 22nd, 1911. It was stolen. It was stolen by a guy named Vincenzo Perugia, or however you pronounce that, who hid in a broom closet in the Louvre, waited until the whole thing closed, came out, took the Mona Lisa, and left. Imagine what would happen if someone stole the Mona Lisa today. Well, back then, the next day, it actually took a painter who went to the museum and noticed it wasn't there to alert the authorities. But once it was stolen, here's the front page of the New York Times from the next day. Front page news! Famous painting stolen, or kind of famous painting stolen. Uh, notice it doesn't even really call it the Mona Lisa. Call it La Gioconda, and mentioned down there below that it was known to some as the Mona Lisa. So this was worldwide news. And I know it's hard to imagine how news could have been worldwide in 1911 when we didn't have cable TV and we didn't have the internet. But it really was like a total worldwide intrigue. Did you know that Pablo Picasso was one of the original suspects? And this went on for two years until Vincenzo finally like got anxious and he tried to sell it and somebody caught him and he went to jail. From then on, it was the most famous painting in the world. Now, you don't remember that happening. You weren't alive yet. You probably didn't even know it happened. But your great-grandparents, your grandparents, your great-great-grandparents did follow it and they kind of passed word along by osmosis. Uh, also, people who wrote art books followed it, and they included the Mona Lisa more prominently in art books. And, and now, if you Google most famous painting in the world, look what you get. It even beat Jesus uh, and God. So, who cares? Well, it's worth considering this kind of weird fame when you're planning your travels. I realize not everyone is going out of their way to see the Mona Lisa, but there are lesser examples of the same phenomena. We kind of feel a pressure to go to certain places. Paris, Rome, Athens. I talked about the Grand Tour in another video, uh, and that's partially the result of that. This is where people first traveled to. These are considered like the center of civilization, and so we sort of feel like we have to go. It's just something to keep in mind when you're planning your travels. Think about, am I doing this because somehow everyone thinks I should be doing this? Or am I doing this because this is something I really want to do? Please write what you think. I want to hear from you. Also, like the video and subscribe to the channel. I'll see you in the comments.